Hello, this is Dr. Don Lamont, and I'm really happy to be here today. I thank the Society for Integrative Oncology for inviting me to talk about one of my absolutely favorite topics, which is exercise, diet, and cancer survival. And I hope to share with you today some data that you can put to work in your own practices. And this is a picture of Easter Island, and I promise it comes into play here at another point in our talk, but I just offer this for you to, for somebody to think about. And so you all work very hard in integrative oncology, and you probably have many patients that are similar to these two that I present here. So here are your two patients, and they both have the same question, which is, can exercise really help me now that I've already got cancer? Most of us and our patients already understand that cancer risk is affected by exercise, but what about cancer survival once cancer's actually appeared? So the first patient asking is a 61-year-old man, and he's just come through adjuvant chemotherapy for stage 3 colon cancer. And the second is a woman who, who had chemotherapy several, several years ago for a hormone receptor positive breast cancer, and she's now on tamoxifen. Both these patients are sedentary, and both have high BMIs. The man being above the cutoff for obesity, which is 30, and the woman fitting into the overweight category, which is a BMI between 25 and 29. So here are some possible responses. They're all actually reasonable responses, and I'd like you to, to pick one. The first one, A, you explain to the patients that exercise improves quality of life, but there's no evidence that can delay or prevent cancer recurrence. Or, or B, uh, you could explain, uh, you could tell both patients to walk at an easy pace, two to three miles per hour for 20 minutes, three times a week. C, you could tell both patients to walk briskly at, say, three miles an hour, 20 minutes, three times weekly. Or you could answer D, prescribe different amounts of exercise for each of these patients. So regarding answer A, I'm about to show you data from three large studies that, that consistently show a correspondence between exercise and cancer survival. So perhaps this isn't the best answer for our patients at the moment, and um, we, we'll see it in a little while about how that is. So answer B, well, exercise is important, and, and some is better than none, but I really want to convince you that 20 minutes of easy walking three times a week is just, it's just not enough to accomplish much metabolically for our, our cancer patients. In answer C, the exercise intensity has been bumped up, but the duration and the frequency are, are still a bit inadequate. And that leaves B. And actually, this is how I would approach these two patients. I would give them different exercise prescriptions. And over the next few minutes, I'm going to show you some data that I, I hope will convince you to do the same. So data show a strong association between exercise and survival in breast and colon cancer. These are observational studies. They don't prove causation, but they're provocative. So for today, since we don't have interventional studies that could prove causation, we can answer with a guarded yes uh, to our two patients, the one with colon cancer and the other with breast cancer. We can say yes, exercise. Uh, should help. Um, in the upcoming slide, I'm going to discuss in detail the three cohorts that provided uh, this data. Um, but first, I'll say that we know a lot less about the effects of exercise on survival in other types of cancer other than breast and colon cancer. And a very ambitious study, the Prostate Cancer Lifestyle Trial, showed that men with early stage prostate cancer who ate a low-fat diet and exercise had a, a, a modest drop in PSA over a two-year period, where PSAs climbed in the control group. Um, but we just, we just can't tease the effects of exercise apart from the effects of diet in this study. And, and maybe that's as it should be, because diet and exercise may work synergistically. So at this point, you may be thinking, well, that's fine. But what do I tell my patients who have other types of cancers, cancers besides breast and colon cancer? And uh, a little, in a little while, I'll make some suggestions as to how you can rationally approach that topic with those patients. So how much benefit might a patient expect with exercise? In breast and colon cancer, we can give a clue. Uh, the, the study followed uh, nearly 3,000 women for a median of eight years and found a 50% decrease in the relative risk of breast cancer-related death in those who exercise. That translates to six 
fewer breast cancer deaths per 100 subjects. And that's just from exercise. And I want to mention the nuances in this remarkable study. First, the greatest effect was seen in women who walked briskly three to five hours a week. And there was a slight drop off in effectiveness in the two higher quintiles. And those with stage three disease and those with hormone receptor positive disease also benefited a little more than other subgroups. And the benefit was also prominent in the overweight and in those who were sedentary before diagnosis, where there was a 78% decrease in the relative risk of death. So this is the graph and of this particular study. On the left, you see uh, the vertical axis from top to bottom is increasing, excuse me, from bottom to top is increasing mortality. So for these curves, a high altitude is bad and a low altitude is good. And you see three curves. The top one, I don't know if you can see the very top, represents the subjects reporting the least exercise. And that was about an hour or less per week of walking. The middle curve represents the subjects who walked one to three hours a week or did an equivalent amount of exercise. And the bottom curve represents those who did the equivalent of three or more hours of brisk walking per week. What is this uh, difference in survival? Six fewer deaths per 100 women, is, is that a lot? Well, if you're at all familiar with chemotherapy statistics, you know that this is a, a big effect, uh, one that you can get excited over if you're a chemotherapy person. Um, the kind of effect that we hope for with adjuvant chemotherapy, we oncologists. And you're, you're looking at some recent data from uh, uh, European uh, breast cancer trials group. And with 10 years of follow-up, adjuvant CMF, which is a commonly used breast cancer adjuvant treatment, prevents 10 recurrences per 100 patients. And anthracycline-based regimens, that's anthracyclines or drugs like adriamycin, they prevent eight deaths um, or recurrences over uh, the same period of time. You give tamoxifen for five years, and you decrease the risk of recurrence by 58%. So compare that to exercise, it's 50%. So exercise may actually be nudging at the heels of chemotherapy and tamoxifen. And if, you know, if, if we could do some interventional studies, and this pans out. I think uh, every oncologist will be writing orders for exercise and trying to put it in an IV bag. So on this next slide, we see data from two cohorts of colon cancer patients. One is from the Nurses' Health Study, and the other is from the CALGB89803 cohort. And these cohorts were followed for 9.6 and 8 years, respectively. And, and what do we find? Those subjects who exercise are dying less. We see eight or nine fewer deaths per 100 subjects in the exercising group. Again, this is a powerful effect, comparable to the survival improvements from adjuvant chemotherapy in stage three colon cancer. And since we're showing that exercise is medicine, so to speak, well, let's talk about dosing a little bit. These studies all used the MET hour to quantify exercise. MET is short for the metabolic unit, and it's the ratio of energy used during an activity to the energy used at rest. So walking for an hour at three miles per hour is equivalent to three MET hours, because you burn three times as many calories as you would if you sat on the couch for that hour. So that's all I want you to remember. Walking an hour at three miles per hour is three MET hours. OK? So we're going to do a little arithmetic here. If you walk three hours in one hour, twice that week, you're up to six met hours for that week. Walk that pace for four hours in a week, and you're at 12 met hours for the week, and, and, and so on. So to write a basic exercise prescription, I would say that you need to calculate how many hours of walking at a three mile, mile per hour pace you want your patient to do. When the patient asks, how much exercise do I need, you're going to be prepared to actually tell them in real numbers. And, but I think the surprising answer for most people to this question is it depends on the type of cancer we're dealing with. So the nurses' health study data suggests that nine met hours per week or three hours of walking at a three mile per hour pace is required for the greatest benefit in, in breast cancer patients. And data from the two colon cancer cohorts are consistent with each other. They suggest that for the same benefit as people gained in the nurses' health study for breast cancer, a 50% decrease in the risk of recurrence, that is. Patients with colon cancer may need twice the amount of exercise as breast cancer patients, and that would be 18 met hours a week. And that 
works out to an hour of walking six days a week. So we're still left with wondering what to do with the other types of cancers. And uh, for patients with all the other types of cancers, we have to rely right now on the current Cancer Society recommendations, which are 7.5 met hours per week. And that works out to 30 minutes of brisk walking daily, five days a week. And I wanted to add that I think if a patient is fit and willing, you might want to push them a, a little to add a little bit more than that, maybe getting up to uh, nine med hours or above if they can. So let's talk about how to write an exercise prescription. There are four parts to an exercise prescription. Here they are. They're pretty self-explanatory. Modality has to do with the type of exercise. Is it running? Is it uh, you know, swimming, bicycling? We're going to stick with walking for now. Just to make it simple, that's our modality. If your patient wants to bike or swim or jog, the prescription would, can be adjusted. And there are lots and lots of tables where you can look up equivalent met hours for all kinds of activities, um, from ironing to skiing to... Um, I, I think it's important to show your patient that you take the exercise prescription seriously uh, any other part of their care. So when you're with the patient, take, take a moment to calculate the correct dose write or print out the prescription and put it, put it in the medical record and follow up with your patient. So here's the four-part prescription you would write for your breast cancer patient. And what you give to the patient can simply say, walk three miles in 60 minutes three times a week. And uh, if the patient wants to break it up into 30 minutes six times a week, of course, that's, that's fine. And here we have a prescription for uh, uh, Walk three miles in 60 minutes, six times weekly, and, and so on. I think it's uh, pretty simple, but if you have questions, we can talk about that afterwards. So again, for the other cancers, um, the American Cancer Society guidelines uh, recommend 150 minutes of walking at a three mile per hour pace. That's 7.5 med hours per week. And I've talked about how that's, that's really a minimum. More is probably better, even if we ignore any possibility of cancer-related benefit. You know, cancer patients suffer from other health problems. They can die from things besides cancer. The Nurses' Health Study, for instance, showed a 41% decrease in overall mortality with exercise. So these patients weren't dying of other things either. Exercise was good. So even in that group, the benefits of exercise extended beyond cancer-related mortality. Now we're going to talk a little bit about uh, whether exercise intensity is important. And uh, I'm going to try to convince you that the answer is yes. And uh, we'll start with uh, the speculations about how exercise actually works to improve cancer survival. And most of us think it has something to do with abnormalities in the insulin glucose axis, um, both pre- and post-diagnosis. We think that because diabetes and the metabolic syndrome and obesity are all risk factors for, for breast and colon cancer and some other cancers as well. There was a 2002 study that found that high insulin levels at the time of breast cancer diagnosis predicted a poor prognosis, no matter the treatment or anything, but just having that high insulin level at the time of diagnosis was a, was a bad sign. Another study found a similar correlation between insulin resistance and colorectal cancer. So I want to, you to pay attention to one parameter of exercise that your patients may not have given much thought to, and that's exercise intensity. And studies show that intense exercise lowers insulin level and decreases insulin resistance much more than moderate intensity exercise. And I think what was a big surprise to me when I first heard this in the cardiology literature is that, uh, that even sick people seem to like intense exercise, and they stick with it more than they stick with moderate exercise. So um, that was a big surprise. But what do we mean by intense? Think uphill sprinting or pedaling a stationary bicycle against resistance. Think, think hard, uh, heavy breathing and those kinds of things. Since intense exercise is difficult, it's a good thing to be able to tell our patients and, our, and ourselves that very, very short intervals are effective. And I do mean short, as in 30 seconds, sometimes 20 or even 10 seconds. Sometimes really short intervals like that can do the job. And these intervals can be done using any modality, biking, running, swimming, rowing. The idea is to go to maximal effort for 30 seconds, say, and then rest until you can sprint again, and to aim for a total of four to eight repeats per session. 
I've outlined here what I ask my patients who are cancer survivors to work up to. Uh, but first, I make sure it's safe for them to exercise, that any cardiac risk and so on have been pro properly addressed. And then I have patients start with 10 second intervals and work up to 30 seconds over a few weeks. But you want to stress to patients, oh, excuse me, and this is for sedentary patients. If, you, if somebody's already exercising, walking, and going to the gym a few times a week, uh, you think can start with the 30 seconds. But you want to stress to patients that the intense intervals should be intense at or near maximal effort. They should be hard. It's actually fun for most people. And part of this fun could be because the workout is over in 10 to 15 minutes. You're done for the day. And um, uh, you don't have to do many of these workouts either. Looking at data from a study of young women, um, comparing 15 weeks of high intensity exercise to 15 weeks of a walking program, you're looking at a graph that shows change in fat mass on the vertical axis. So down is good, that's lower fat. And above the horizontal line is bad, that's a gain in fat. And if you look from left to right, you see the high intensity group on the left, and the bar is hanging uh, down below the line. This is good. They lost over 2 kilograms of fat mass in that 15 weeks. And this was not a change in weight. This was a change in fat mass actually measured by a DEXA scan. So these uh, young women lost 15% of their fat mass. And there were no dietary changes. Everybody was asked to stay uh, with their same diet. And uh, you see on the far right, the sedentary group added, actually added a little fat over the 12 weeks. Uh, they, uh, there's a little bump above the line there. Um, to exercise moderately for a uh, uh, 12, for the 15 weeks, they gained fat. They actually gained a little more than the control group that didn't exercise at all. So it's hard to tell patients that you know going for walks is going to do much for for their weight, uh, for their fat. So what was the magic tincture that allowed 20 minutes of workouts to do what 40 minute workouts couldn't in this group? Uh, the answer is uh, what a colleague of mine calls metabolic range of motion, and uh, that means short sprints. So the high intensity group sprinted for eight seconds. And they rested for 12 seconds, and they repeated this cycle for 20 minutes. Now, this is a hard workout. I know sprinting for eight seconds doesn't sound very hard, but sprinting for eight seconds over and over again uh, for 20 minutes is, is hard. They did this three times a week. The moderate intensity group exercised at 60% capacity. Um, and they did this, but twice as long for 40 minutes. And so they exercised twice as long, not as intensely. And what did they get for it? Uh, they got a little fatter. And they weren't having much fun either, apparently, that almost twice as many subjects, uh, seven, dropped out of the moderate intensity arm, and only four dropped out of the high intensity arm. So you know, we could say no pain um, and uh, too much gain in fat, actually. So now I'm going to show you a, uh, a slide that uh, looks deeper into metabolism than, than fat. We're looking at a slide talking about insulin um, sensitivity shows data from a study comparing effects of high and moderate intensity exercise on insulin resistance. And on the left, on the vertical axis, from bottom to top, we see insulin sensitivity from low to high. So the higher a box reaches, the better the insulin sensitivity. So unlike the previous graph, in this graph, high is good. And you see that over on the, you see three groups of exercisers. Uh, the control group, which was sedentary. The moderate exercise group, MEG, and the uh, vigorous exercise group. And you see that the vigorous exercise group enjoyed a nice increase in their insulin sensitivity, which we think is an, an important uh, factor in terms of uh, recovering from cancer and avoiding recurrence. I mentioned that high intensity means hard, even though for a short time, within a few seconds. But by the third repeat or so, there's, there's sweat everywhere, and there's a lot of grunting and groaning and hard breathing and grimaces. And that kind of thing. It's not pretty. So some people reasonably, I think, assert that rather than discourage sedentary would-be exercises with the word hard, it's probably wiser to promote easier forms of exercise and hope that more people will at least do something. And I know this is a bit counterintuitive. I found it this way. But, but studies that have asked this head on, which is, will people stick to a high-intensity program? Um, have come up with, yes, people do stick to high-intensity regimens. 
Now this study that you're looking at here showed that two years after a heart attack diagnosis, 84% of those who went through a high intensity rehab program, that is lots of short sprints, were still exercising. That's two years later, they're still exercising. Only 54%, a little more than half, were, who completed a moderate intensity rehab program, which was walking basically, were still exercising two years later. And so so it's, it's easier to stick to for some reason. It seems to be more interesting. But can sick people do this kind of workout? Well, this slide helps to answer that. The 27 elderly men in this trial had just had a heart attack, a particularly bad heart attack, because they were all in heart failure. That is, their heart was so weak it could barely squeeze blood through their veins and arteries. Even so, these really sick patients responded well to high-intensity exercise. In fact, they had almost three times the improvement in cardiovascular fitness as the heart patients that went through a, uh, a walking program. So I, I know that most of you in integrated medicine are yourselves exemplary models of how to fit exercise into your life. You work so hard to bring, bring the news about exercise to your patients. So how to help your patients take exercise seriously? So I think the answer is to treat it as any, other, as any other medicine, as I've mentioned before. A wise colleague is the one who once suggested to me that I actually write exercise prescriptions. I was desperate, and I, I'm kind of dating myself here, but this was in the days of those old-fashioned paper prescription pads. And I, I could see patients' eyes light up with a new understanding. Oh, she really thinks this is going to work. When I would just scribble the word exercise out in longhand and hand it to them on a piece of paper. And I would take a carbon copy in their paper chart. And it, and it helped even more when I told them I was, I was going to check up on how it was going at the next visit. So you know, I know you can be much more sophisticated than I was then. You, know, you can now fit the dose of the exercise to the condition. You can put the four elements in your prescription, what kind of exercise, how hard, how long, how often. Um, and uh, you can fit the uh, exercise prescription to the diagnosis. So for a patient with breast cancer, three hours a week of walking. Uh, for colon cancer, uh, you aim for six hours. Uh, for other types of cancer, uh, 30 minutes of walking most days. But again, if your patient is able, you want to consider bumping it up. And finally, for everyone, add a little spice with uh, one and no more than two high-intensity, short, high-intensity sprint workouts per week. OK. So I asked you to remember and notice the photo of Easter Island. And, and now you see a picture of a plant um, go through it. It has a lot of names. goes through French lilac, Italian fish, and uh, I think my favorite is professor weed. So I put it here because it holds another clue to how diet and exercise may, may work against cancer. And I'll get to that soon, but talk now about, about diet. So, you're going to recognize these patients. Two of them are the same. There are two new ones as well. And they all have the same question for you. Are there any dietary changes I can make that might help me live longer? So the first patient is our 62-year-old with stage 3 colon cancer who is obese. And of course, you remember the second patient, too, with stage 2 breast cancer who's overweight but, but not obese. And our third patient is new. He has localized, low-grade prostate cancer and he has a normal weight. And your fourth patient also has a normal weight and localized prostate cancer, but his prostate cancer is high grade, Gleason 8. So here's another question, and um, how would you respond to these patients? I would like you to choose your response. Would you A, recommend that these patients increase their dietary fiber? Would you recommend that they decrease their meat intake? Would you recommend replacing animal fat with vegetable oil? or increasing fruit and vegetable intake, decreasing calorie intake, or would you say that the answer depends on the type of tumor, for instance, the primary site and the uh, biological uh, I, I think you're catching on here. The data, for as far as A, the data show that increasing dietary fiber doesn't decrease the risk of recurrence after a cancer diagnosis, so, so A is probably not the best answer, although it's not a bad answer. Um, decreasing meat intake has likewise not been shown to decrease recurrence risk, so B is not the best answer, although, it's, again, it's not a bad answer either. Answer C asks patients to change from saturated to unsaturated fats, 
And I'm going to show data that show why this is not the best answer and how vegetable oils may actually worsen the prognosis in at least one particular subtype of, of uh, common cancer. Regarding response D, increasing fruit and vegetable intake has been associated with decreased incidence of some cancers, but current data show that making this adjustment after a breast cancer diagnosis doesn't seem to make any impact on survival. Again, I don't think there's any harm in, in recommending increasing food and vegetable intake, and it may improve a patient's health. But as far as improving cancer-related survival, we, we can't say that that's true at this point. So answer E, decreasing energy intake, that is, eating fewer calories. Now, this does improve survival in, in some cancers, but not others. So E, although not a bad answer, isn't, isn't the best answer. And of course, that brings us to F, which you're, you're catching on to now. And that's, um, uh, I'm going to show you the data that I uh, think will convince you that uh, it's important, to, again, to consider, just as we did in exercise, to consider the biological characteristics of a patient's tumor when making dietary recommendations as well. This slide uh, has some interesting data. Uh, you recall that our first patient is an obese man with stage 3 colon cancer. So, uh, this study is, is addressed to patients like this, and back in 2007, researchers finally showed that diet affected the survival of, of colon cancer patients. And this cohort, the CALGB 89803, consisted of over 1,000 stage 3 colon cancer patients, and they were followed for a, a median of over five years. And they found that those reporting what was called the Western dietary pattern died of colon cancer more often than those reporting a prudent dietary pattern. Now, the adjusted hazard ratio was 3.25, and this is a big effect. That, again, one that's comparable to the effect of chemotherapy for stage 3 colon cancer. But the researchers thought this might be due to weight, so they stratified by BMI and weight loss. But there was, there was no effect there, so they decided that something in the Western diet quote unquote, or missing from the Western diet was the culprit. And the, the researchers went looking for it. And they, they looked in the kitchen, and here are the Western and prudent dietary patterns lined up for inspection. And for any random American, which was what the cohort consisted of, there is going to be a lot of overlap between these two diets. So various foods were weighed, weighted, and broken down into more categories in hopes that the major problem in the Western diet could be found. And you can tell by the way they named the contrasting diet the prudent diet. You know they were expecting, expecting to find the answer on one side or the other, either a good thing on the right-hand list or a, a bad thing on the left-hand list. Well, get ready for a surprise. They were surprised. That was back in 2007. By 2012, the Western diet was no longer the culprit. Carbohydrates were the culprit in this cohort. And this study found that increasing daily carbohydrate consumption, increased cancer recurrence, and mortality across the five quintiles of intake, meaning the more carb uh, patients ate, and, uh, the, the, the uh, greater the death rate. And this cut across the Western and prudent lines. And, and in fact, it accounted for all the difference between them, meaning that in this new analysis, the prudent diet didn't help you if you overdosed on whole grains. So, there's one more important finding in the study that I want to emphasize, and that's that carbohydrates only harmed the overweight and obese in this study. When looking at the normal weight subjects, any relationship between carbohydrate intake and survival vanished. And when the researchers looked at weight loss, that too played no role in survival in these patients. So that's something I want you to remember when you face your patient with stage 3 colon cancer. For those colon cancer patients who are overweight or obese, carb restrictions may be particularly important. And weight loss, weight loss does often occur with carb restriction, but weight loss itself may not be important. Um, but of course, this research is a work in progress. In a few years, we'll probably be able to answer this question of whether a particular cancer patient can improve survival by losing weight. And if I were a betting person, I'd, I'd put my money on, on this one particular answer, and that answer would be, it depends. So this study looked at something called the daily glycemic index and glycemic load. How much of a particular food will raise blood sugar? 
there are tables all over the internet and, and all over the literature for looking up glycemic index and glycemic load. I want you to remember just one thing, and that's that glycemic index and glycemic load are related, but they are not the same. And here, we're going to talk about glycemic load. So everything I'm going to talk about from now on is basically going to be about glycemic load. So in this study, subjects in the highest carbohydrate quintile consumed an average daily glycemic load of 172. The lowest quintile came in at 112 per day. So this brings some good news and some bad news. What we, we usually think of as good carbs can deliver a huge glycemic load. The numbers below are for one cup of whole grain spaghetti, for instance. Uh, that's either bad news or good news, depending on how much you like whole grain spaghetti. But some treat foods actually deliver a low glycemic index. That's the good news. And uh, so look at the Dove bar here. It's just a little bit higher than the orange and way, way below the potato. Um, so the trick with carb is, is to watch serving size. Uh, it really, really matters. What are good carbs? Are any starches good? Well, yes, but only under one condition, and that is great, great moderation. The starches include wonderful foods like legumes, whole oats, brown rice, even potatoes, which we saw has a high glycemic load. In fact, it has a glycemic index, not load, but glycemic index, which is higher than white sugar. That's potatoes for you. But there are some good things, even in these foods. So teach your overweight colon cancer patients that it's fine to eat starchy foods but it's really, really important to measure the quantities. They may want to limit to one or two slices of whole wheat bread or a cup of starch. That's eight liquid ounces of any, uh, you know, eight, eight liquid ounces per meal. That's any one of those at a meal is, is plenty for someone who's worried about colon cancer survival. And someone always asks me this, well, if you have only one slice of bread per meal, does that mean that the half of, half of the sandwich is naked? So, um, I, I, it, yes, it does. I guess you could fold it over, but you're going to have to ask your obese colon cancer patient to strictly limit starches to a small serving or less per meal and aim for a glycemic load per day of 100 or less. So the next one on my list here is, is a bit controversial, but um, I put it here for thought. Sugar. It's addictive. Um, yes, for some people. So are artificial sweeteners for some people. So if someone says to me, well, life isn't worth living unless some sweetening is involved, I ask them to do what I do with starches. Just measure. Go for quality, of course. Use raw sweeteners if you can, including cane when possible. Use high quality honey. Uh, if you want to go exotic and use agave nectar, that's fine. Use it. But measure it and keep track. Just keep the glycemic load under 100 for that day. Another trick. Less cooking makes the starches and grains less bioavailable. So go for the al dente pasta, go for the slow cooked oats, not the quick or the instant oats, which have been smashed to uh, expose the starch and, and, and decrease cooking time. Uh, they have a higher glycemic load than whole grain oats. Fruits contain sugar, yes, but it's diluted by water and it's tempered by fiber, it's digested more slowly, so the glycemic load of most fruits is very, very reasonable. Again, check the glycemic load tables, and if it's a high glycemic index fruit, like banana or pineapple, eat it, but watch the portion, portion, size, portion size. So raw vegetables have low glycemic indices. Flesh foods have a glycemic index of zero, because they have no carbohydrates at all. So you can't have a glycemic index if you do, or a load if you have no carbohydrates. And life doesn't have to be grim with a low glycemic load. Again, get familiar with the glycemic load table. And if you go over, say, 33 on one meal, make up for it at the next meal. Uh, just keep the daily load under 100. Now let's turn to our second patient, the overweight breast cancer patient. Um, and let's talk about two trials that, were, uh, that gave us the data we need to counsel her. The Women's Interventional Nutrition Study randomized almost 2,500 breast cancer patients to a low-fat arm and a control arm. 
And the Women's Healthy Eating and Living Study went a step further. It randomized 3,000 women to a low-fat arm, to low-fat arms and control arms. But it also asked the low-fat low arm to eat a high-fiber diet and 12 servings of fruits and vegetables every day. So on one side, we have the WINS trial, low-fat versus no, no intervention. And we have the WELL trial, low-fat plus high fruit and vegetables plus high-fiber versus uh, no change. So who do you think won? The low-fat alone group won. Well, what happened? Everybody knows fruits and vegetables are important, right? Well, weight loss happened. And the well, WINS trial actually lost weight. And they ate fewer calories than the control arm. All of this is uh, in the data from these studies. In the WELLS trial, the intervention and control arm ate the same amount of calories. And all those fruits and vegetables did not save those women from the same fate as the control arm, despite the uh, low fat and the, all the nutrients and everything. So we tell our breast cancer patients that data show that 12 daily servings of fruits and vegetables are unlikely to prolong her life in terms of breast cancer. Now, a low fat diet may help, we could say, but only if accompanied by weight loss. And please note that the weight loss was modest, only about six pounds and more weight loss may not be better. In fact, I want to point out that studies looking at just at purposeful weight loss after breast cancer have been inconsistent in showing a survival benefit. We're going to talk about our two prostate cancer patients next. We have some very specific recommendations to make to them, and the data behind these recommendations come from the health professional's follow-up study. The data from this observational study of over 3,500 doctors with prostate cancer found that progression from early stage to late stage or metastatic disease was associated with three dietary factors, tomato sauce, alpha-linolenic acid, and dietary calcium. But the relationship of these components to disease progression, it depended on the characteristics of the prostate cancer itself, specifically the Gleason score. In subjects with a low Gleason score, that is a low-risk prostate cancer, low risk, the higher the tomato sauce intake, the lower the risk of progression to metastatic disease. And in low-grade disease, for alpha-linolenic acid, which is found in vegetable oil, the higher the intake, the worse the prognosis. So our patient with low-grade prostate cancer should avoid salad dressing and should put extra tomato sauce on his pizza. So some people have tried to find the active ingredient in tomato sauce, and uh, they generally come up with lycopene. And one study gave lycopene, uh, which is an orange pigment in tomatoes, uh, or placebo to orchiectomy patients and found fewer deaths at two years in the lycopene arm. But this is a, a small study and more, much more needs to be done to illuminate why, if or why, tomatoes might benefit prostate cancer patients. But certainly if a patient likes tomatoes, uh, there can be no harm in, in uh, eating as many of them as they would like. Uh, what do we answer our patient with high-grade prostate cancer? The health professional follow-up study found that high calcium intakes were related to worse outcomes in patients with Gleason scores of eight or higher. Now, calcium is found in dairy products, so one wonders if there could be something in dairy products besides calcium that could have caused that association, but that was not answered by this study, so that will have to be left for future studies. For after uh, prostate cancer uh, diagnosis, we have two different sets of advice um, Eat cooked tomatoes at least twice a week if, if the tumor is low grade and limit or avoid vegetable oil. Um, if the tumor is high grade, uh, limit calcium intake and is that possibly due to dairy? That's the question that remains. So how does all of this uh, fit together with what we know of biology? There's a signaling pathway um, that spurs growth and it's called mTOR. And what it does is uh, encourage cell survival and growth, cell division, angiogenesis, the drawing of new blood vessels into a tissue to counteract hypoxia, things like that. Of course, it's not the only signaling pathway that, that uh, accomplishes this. There are parallel pathways. Um, it's very complex. There's a whole network of, of signaling pathways that have to do with this. But mTOR is often uh, in many, many common cancers. So basically a messenger, if things are, the uh, message is basically uh, uh, mTOR is turned on and the messages grow uh, 
be fruitful and multiply and fill your niche all as well with the, the world. So, you know, a cell is, is not stupid. There are lots of other signals coming in, and it's not always a good thing to grow and divide. Um, and a healthy cell can ignore end course messages, in particular if the other messages contradict the wisdom of grow now order. For instance, if there's a lot of physical pressure around uh, a particular cell, that signals that a particular organ or tissue is quite big enough. Thank you. Um, so there are many things that can counteract this. And here's where Easter Island comes in. It's also called Rapa Nui uh, by the Polynesian people who live there. And in the soil of this little island grows a bacteria. And this bacteria makes a fungicide that scientists collected because they, they thought it might make a good antifungal medicine. They named it Rapamycin after Rapa Nui, where it was found. Um, and it, it didn't pan out. It didn't pan out as a fungicide. But it actually turns off a huge part of the immune system. So it turns out to be a good medicine. It's good for organ transplants where you want some immune suppression, things like that. Also, as scientists played around with rapamycin, they happened, and this is an accident, they actually found that it makes rodents live a very, very long time. Rapamycin is almost a fountain of youth. And I'll come back to that in a second. And this is Galiga officinalis, and this is the plant that you saw earlier go through, and it's Professor's weed. And this is the source of several medicinal compounds that lower blood sugar and also now are being used in cancer therapy. And one of those you will have heard of, it's called metformin. Some of its uh, brand names are Gupifage, Glumetza, Fortimet, and so on. And it was a big surprise in figuring out how these uh, uh, drugs work. They actually turn off mTOR. So when mTOR gets turned off, cell survival, growth, division, and angiogenesis actually ceases, goes away. Hyphen and metformin are, are great drugs. But you can control a healthy mTOR signaling pathway without any drugs at all. Eat too many calories and on mTOR can go. Eat too few and off it goes. Now this is an extremely simplified version of what really happens. There are a lot of other, other intertwined and parallel signaling pathways. And in many cancers, some of these pathways are damaged by genetic mutation. So I don't want anyone to think you can cure cancer by taking in fewer calories. It's just not true. But you may be able to help the other anti-cancer treatments along by not giving signals to grow, 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 by not eating too much, by burning lots of calories with exercise, and in some cases, perhaps by taking it easy with carbs. Uh, um, by saying that exercise and cancer survival are associated in observational studies. Those with BMI greater than 25 may benefit the most from exercise. Exercise requirements may differ by cancer diagnosis. And intensity matters. So take care of any cardiovascular risks first. And if it's safe, bump the exercise up a few notches once or twice a week and for very short periods. And to conclude about diet, you want to ask your four patients to pay as much attention to what they don't eat as to what they do eat. So for the overweight colon cancer patient, limiting the diet daily glycemic load to 100 or less is probably wise. And there are tables listing glycemic loads for hundreds of common foods. About a week spent with the table gets a person pretty comfortable with most of the foods that they usually eat. For breast cancer patients, limiting fat enough to lose a small amount of weight, six pounds, may be prudent. In low-grade prostate cancer, avoiding vegetable oils is prudent, and it would be a good idea to eat tomato sauce twice a week or so. And in high-grade prostate cancer, avoiding dairy calcium may be helpful. And I, again, I want to emphasize that research into diet and exercise and cancer is it's definitely a work in progress. Things are going to evolve. And what we've talked about today is only what we can say for today. And I think it's an exciting field that uh, will continue to surprise us. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Lamont. And if any new question and answer session right now, Norlina Gullett has a question.
Yeah, we were talking a little bit about carbohydrates, and I guess I, you know, I, I think that it's not quite that simple. I guess in my experience and based on the literature I read and what I talk to my patients about are, you know, switching really from the, the simple processed carbs that are in things like bread and cereals to high quality grains like, you know, brown rice, quinoa, millet, amaranth. And these are things that are unfortunately relatively foreign to, to the American diet. But um, I think I, you know, I guess I just would like to get your perspective on that. I think part of it is just not just limiting carbs, but really switching to higher quality carbs. And, and definitely takes sort of an education because it's very different than the American traditional diet. Well, sure. You know, I think that's a really good point. And I think that, you know, in the um, CALGB 89803 study, they tried to look at, at uh, you know, a, a little bit of, you know, was it whole grains, was it the prudent diet, was it the Western diet? And they yeah. kept coming up with carbs. And, uh, you know, I don't know how many of the patients were eating, you know, really exquisite carbs. But I still think that, the you know, one has to be careful with, with, with carbs in large amounts, even, and I don't think that people should cut out carbs. I, I hope I didn't come across as saying that. I yeah. really don't. I think that, you know, you have to be careful to limit the quantities. People can eat huge amounts of carbs. A hundred, a glycemic load of a hundred per day is really not that limiting. And you notice that the difference, though, between the survival, uh, between the highest and the lowest quintile, and a big survival difference was 72 points of glycemic load per day. So the highest group was it was a mean of had a mean of 172 uh, glycemic load per day, and the uh, lowest group was about 100. Although some of the people in the lowest group, there was a span of I think it went from 65 to 120, something like that. So there's some subtleties here. I I, I think you're right. I think that we'll have to tease that out. But I do mm -hmm. think that we have to you know really pay attention to carbs, and people can overdose even on good carbs. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean. I, I think potatoes are, you know, nothing, I don't think there's anything better on earth than a nice, fluffy, steaming baked potato. But, you know, too much of that uh, mm -hmm. may be a problem for, for some people at least. And again, we saw this in the obese patients. So that's another interesting nuance that we're going to have to tease out. Why was, why was this just in the obese patients? It didn't seem to matter if the patients of normal weight uh, overdosed on carbs. So. So all of these are very interesting questions, and I, you know, I think that those wonderful foods that you mentioned, uh, the whole grains, are really quite beautiful foods, and we, we need to encourage our patients to eat them. I think we need to encourage our patients not to eat too much. Dr. Lamont, we also have a question by Kevin Brown. Kevin, would you like Hi. Um, in the uh, prostate cancer study that you talked about, did they differentiate between different types of vegetable oils, and do you feel like... Or is there any evidence of a difference between the different types of vegetable oils? They looked at something called alpha-linolenic acid. So they looked at vegetable oils that had those, that particular moiety in it. So, so that was what they were looking for. And when they, when they did the analysis, that kept popping up as a, as a problem in their, in their data in terms of survival for low-grade cancer, prostate cancer patients. So I, I don't know exactly which oils uh, you know, have the most alpha-linolenic acid. I know it's prominent in most vegetable oils, including olive oil, unfortunately. And, um, you know, and I don't think that the answer is never eat an oil. I think the answer is, uh, you know, I think the answer lies in being aware of, of, of these things that may play a role. And if you have a choice that's reasonable, maybe move away from that as much as possible. Great, thank you. And Dr. Lamont, that is actually it for our questions. Do you have any attendees for joining us? And please also join us for our next webinar, Herb Drug Interactions in Cancer Care by Dr. Young on February 20th. If you have any questions, you may also email us at memberservices at integrativeonc.org. Thank you again and have a wonderful evening. Do you have anything else?